Welcome to this episode of Evidence of Greatness. Um, this, in this episode, we're going to review an article that's called History Construction, A Brief and Selective History um, by Martin Conway and Mark Howe. Um, and what I want to say about this is that this is, um, they created a paper that's the beginning of a special issue on memory and memory construction. And so this is just a brief overview of that special section, which is a little unusual for me to be covering an article like this. Um, but I think there's some really important conclusions that they draw and they walk us through kind of the history of what we know about um, memory um, across time and how, how our understanding of memory has changed over time. And so I thought that would be uh, an important component and I'm gonna make some connections to solution-focused brief therapy and particularly the history of the outcome that's part of the diamond. Um, and so hopefully this is useful to you. Um, so the first thing that we need to consider is what is memory construction? And the idea of memory construction is that memories are constructed rather than simply retrieved. So for a while, we kind of had the understanding that um, memories were just stored in our brains. And then when we needed them, we would go back and retrieve them and bring them back. And it was an accurate representation of what um, had happened. Um, or we were just recalling um, basically a recording of what had happened. And memory construction takes a slightly different perspective and says, we don't actually store our memories in that way. And we don't just go back and retrieve them but in some sense, we construct our memories. And so a lot of what we're gonna talk about here is um, why this idea of memory construction is kind of the, the current understanding of memory. Um, they go back all the way to 1882 and with, uh, with a person named Rybutt. And um, he was the first to kind of realize or overtly talk about this idea of time compression. And so a lot of what we're gonna be talking about fits into the category of autobiographical memories. And what that means is these are memories about myself, about my lived experience, and I'm going back and collecting them. So it's not that I'm remembering something that has happened in history per se in general, but it's something that is my experience and um, I'm going back and remembering what I did or how I lived my life. And one of the things that Rybot mentioned is um, in real time, experiences occurred over long periods of time. Let's say perhaps an hour. Let's say I go to a party and I'm at the party for five hours. And I don't just, I don't, I don't store those five hours minute by minute in my memory, but instead that time period is compressed in my memory and I can retrieve the memory of those five hours in a couple of minutes. And so he was, he was the one that kind of started to hypothesize and say, perhaps we have a mental representation of events or experiences and it's not actually recalling um, exact uh, recall of what's going on. So this was kind of the first time in recorded history that we have someone kind of speculating, um, there's something different about our memory than our real life lived experience. And then that we fast forward a bit into the 1930s, 1932, and there's this now construct of social psychology about memory. And um, Bartlett did a study um, where he gave people, he read people um, a story or an experience um, from a culture that was vastly different than their own. And then over time, repeated times, he asked them to recall the story. So let's say, for example, um, I'm here in the United States, and let's say um, I'm told a story about um, Aboriginal um, or First Nation people in Australia. 
And it's so vastly different than my experience. And then let's say I'm asked to recall that story one month later and two months later and three months later. What Bartlett discovered is that over time, my recall would change. And the details of the story, the details of the experience would change. And the changes that would occur would make the story more consistent with my experience as, um, as a United States citizen and less consistent with the Australian experience. And so I, I don't have, again, I don't have a, an accurate recall of the exact details, but I construct the story in a way that makes sense to me. And because the original story was outside of my realm, then I didn't, um, I don't remember all of those specific details, but I alter those things to be consistent with what makes sense to me. And so this then led to this idea of memory alteration. Um, our memories change, they're not static, they're not actual representations of reality. And so you can see here again, there's time compression, my memories change to fit into a small amount of time. And then there's this a memory alter alteration over, over time, my memories change. Then we fast forward a bit into the 1960s um, with the understanding of cognitive psychology. And cognitive psychology started looking at how does the mind or the brain represent the world? Um, and does memory represent our experience and our knowledge? And so Quillian and his colleagues, um, they started studying and they said, memory must be stored in such a way that it supports inference. So this is now where we start to get this idea of, I don't have stored every single detail, but I have kind of stored categories. And I infer or I make meaning of new experience based on these categories of understanding that I already have. So the example that they gave was, I don't store the memory of Napoleon has toes, right? Um, we don't store that exact memory. I don't have a specific recall of somebody telling me, oh, Napoleon, he had some toes. Um, but instead, we infer that knowledge. We hold in our minds that people have toes and Napoleon was a person and therefore Napoleon must have toes. So it's not that I have memory of that, but I construct that knowledge based on inference. So then one of the things that they also talked about is that long-term memory is stored in hierarchical levels. And again, this hierarchical levels, they can help us to make inferences. So things at lower levels inherit the qualities of higher level categorizations. So again, I can say, um, birds are animals. And so birds are stored at one level, animals are stored at a higher level. The birds inherently um, or inherit the things that of the higher level, that means they must be alive. They must be able to die. They must breathe in some way, right? So, so the higher level category informs the qualities and characteristics of a lower level. Later, this was shown to be too simplistic but it does help us lead, lend understanding to how our memories are stored kind of in buckets of knowledge, kind of in ways that we can make inferences from one group of category to another. All of these, like I mentioned before, fit into these autobiographical memories. Um, what, in essence, my memories about myself. And now this is where it becomes important and I'll make some connections to solution-focused therapy. One of the things that they talk about is that typically autobiographical details are a combination of inferred memories and episodic memories. And we've talked a little bit about inferred memories, but we haven't talked about episodic memories. Episodic memories are memories that are specific to one particular experience. So there's a couple of things we need to talk about. One is we infer some of the details based on these general categories and others, we hold these details that are specific to a particular event. They then give, go on to give this example of somebody going for an interview. And if I think back to a time when I had an interview, there are some things that I can remember, some things that I can remember. Perhaps I remember a specific question, or perhaps I remember myself thinking through how am I gonna give this particular response that's meaningful. 
So I hold on to that memory that's from that particular episode or that specific event. But I also combine that with inferred memories um, that I then apply to that specific episode. So in this case, I may remember the specific response to a question, but I don't remember necessarily what the interviewer was wearing. Um, but I infer that everyone there must have been wearing, must have been fully clothed, or that would have stood out to me as something specific from this episode that I needed to remember, right? And so you can re potentially remember like the specific tie that someone had on or the specific blouse that they were wearing or the clothes that you chose to wear to, the, to this particular interview. That's the episodic memory, but you may not um, remember all of the details around like what was the upholstery on the chairs like. Now, what's the connection for solution-focused brief therapy? As we go back in time and we ask people about the, the history of their outcome, when we ask them, tell me about a time when your desired outcome was present, they may remember specific episodic details, but we ask them really specific questions they might not remember exactly. So what they need to do then is to make inferences and to say, when, when I've felt my desired outcome before, these kinds of things tend to be the case. Or if my desired outcome is happiness, there are times when I've been happy or there are stories that I've read about happiness or I've seen television shows where happiness was present. I've had some exposure to happiness before. So I make inferences about my understanding, my knowledge of happiness, and I apply it to my specific memory. And I say, well, I must have smiled in that moment. And then the other thing that's really fascinating about this is that we can say, and what did it mean when you smiled in that way? And they can make inferences of, well, if I smiled and happiness was present, I guess it would mean this. And they're constructing a memory of a time when their desired outcome was present, that may not have full episodic details, but instead general inferences about what they know and understand about happiness. In addition, if we ask small details, like you know, who noticed that you were smiling in this way that was consistent with your desired outcome at the time, they're gonna make inferences. They might not have a specific moment in time that they remember, but they would remember who was important to them in at that period of time in their lives. And so they could draw on that and say, well, I suppose my partner would have noticed. What would they have noticed about you, right? And again, I then have to infer, well, my partner knows when I'm happy and when I'm not happy. So they would have inferred that I was happy because of this smile. And so then they're constructing a memory um, that may not have been an accurate memory, but it's one that represents the totality of who they are and their interactions um, that they've had. So again, you can see here that those Episodic memories are important. You can see that memory alteration is a principle that comes up of like, I'm changing what this time period meant based on the way that I'm describing it. So you can see in this idea that um, reality is co-constructed. And it's not, it's not that we're asking them to lie or to make things up, but we're asking them to relay some episodic details and we're asking them to make inferences from their everyday life that could inform this description. And then this quote here at the bottom, I think is important. It says autobiographical memories are then com complications of knowledge constructed during an act of recall and consists of some experience near or episodic knowledge. How do we not know, but this is how, how this happens, we don't know, but this is most probably related to goal active to the goals that are active during the memory formation and construction and more experience or distance or conceptual knowledge that act to concept contextualize the recalled episodic knowledge. What does all that mean? One of the things I think that's really, really important is this part in the middle where it says, this is probably related to the goals that are active during the memory formation or the reconstruction. So, the purpose of why I'm recalling this will influence the way that I recall it. So if the purpose is to provide a description about the desired outcome, that premise will influence what memories I construct or how I put this together. 
And so in essence, we are literally asking them to construct something meaningful that's connected to their desired outcome. There's a huge amount of power here because we're changing their reality. We're giving them perhaps new episodic memories um, from the detail, the description of this particular moment. And we're asking them to place meaning on this inferred knowledge that they have. So you can see here how change can take place in the past or in our history, simply because of the way that our memory is, the memory construction works. Um, so I think this is really, really fascinating. So then we get to this question of, so then are memories accurate? And what, and what the authors of this study kind of conclude is that it's really, really complex. And so it doesn't really fit into an everyday description or definition of accuracy. We can't say it's true or it's not true. It's right or it's wrong um, because it's based on inference, because it's based on construction. So one suggestion is that what is constructed as memory is consistent in this case, fairly highly consistent with what could, should, or perhaps possibly did actually happen. And so I think that's one of the things that's really, really valuable is to think about um, this idea of this could have happened, this should have happened based on my current goal or construction modality. Um, and then these last couple points at the bottom is that memory construction is about consistency with pre-existing knowledge and only secondarily is it about what actually happened. And I think that's really important because what we're accessing here is pre-existing knowledge that you oftentimes hear Elliot or I say something like in order to just in order to tell me what their desired outcome is they must have had some experience with it previously and I think that that may be not direct experience like this like episodic experience but it could be from inferred experience again maybe I've seen it on television or maybe I've known somebody else who had this um, quality or characteristic that I'm hoping to have and so we make we make inferences based on our pre-existing knowledge and that helps us to construct a memory. And then finally, memory construction implicitly or explicitly is the current framework in which modern memory research is embedded. So basically what that's saying is this is the current understanding we have of memory. Um, it may be shown to be inaccurate down the road, but as of right now, this is the best description that we have of how memory works. So as we do history of the outcome descriptions, it's really, really important for us to have this understanding in our minds that we're constructing memory and it allows us to ask really meaningful questions that, that ask, our ask our clients to infer things and we can convey trust and complete confidence in them that they can construct this, even though it might be difficult. And so again, there's a this contributes to the stance that we have as solution-focused brief therapists to, to convey confidence, to convey trust, to convey that we understand it might be difficult because they literally are constructing new memory as they engage in this process. So that's such a powerful thing to be thinking about. And it really gives us an understanding of how this co-construction can be occurring. And then finally, this is the reference for this article in case you want to read this article or the other articles that are in this special issue as well. Um, but I hope that was helpful. I hope that you um, I hope that you found that useful, especially as it connects to solution folks free therapy. And I hope it gives you confidence to um, to do these history of the outcome descriptions, um, knowing that, um, it might be difficult, it might be challenging, but it'll be really worthwhile and it will change the meaning making that these clients have. So um, let me know what you think. I'd love to hear your thoughts or questions. And um, until next time, we'll see you later.